Hello everyone and welcome to another slideshow here on my channel. I'm Cody and today I'm actually following up on a previous video I've done about Romania's search for their next tank. They have picked one and it is the US Abrams. Now I'm not going to do the entire spiel from the last video. If you want to watch that for more details you're more than welcome to. I'll try to put a little uh, notification badge thingy up in the top right there. Uh, but why am I following up on this? Well Romania's Ministry of Defense has come out and said they have chose the Abrams and they're working on a government-to-government -government deal right now for 54 Abrams of an unspecified um, make and model. So we don't really specifically know. It'll probably want to be one of the previous export models we've seen. Um, and I'll kind of talk about that in more detail in a little bit. But I thought it would be fun to kind of go over the Abrams, Romania, and kind of see how this choice fits within their kind of larger scope. So, what am I going to cover in particular? We're going to take a look at the Abrams, kind of some of the specs, some of the features. We're going to look at the organization of Romania's tank battalions and how these 54 could fit into that. We'll take a look at Romania's geography. We'll take a look at the politics of it all, both in Romania and then kind of in the context of Moldova and Ukraine. My personal thoughts on the topic and my credits at the end. So they're getting 54 Abrams of some unspecified variant. We don't 100% know. It could be like an M1A1 AIM, which is um, what the Australians use, if I'm correct. It could be the uh, M1... A2S, I believe, which is, or maybe it's the M1A1S that has like an upgrade package, which is the Saudi Arabian variant. Um, those are kind of the two big ones that are floating around. It could just be a base version of the M1A2 as well. It's hard to say. It's definitely not going to have the depleted uranium armor because none of the export variants do. But all the other features are very possible um, in terms of what's there. But anyway. It uses the L54M256A1 120mm smoothbore gun. Pretty standard fare for most of your modern westernized tanks. It is fully stabilized. It can shoot on the move. It does have thermal optics, and it stores 42 rounds in total. It is a four-man crew, so there's no autoloader here. As I said, no depleted uranium armor, so it's going to be some kind of other variant of uh, composite. It could vary as well, depending on which export variant, but most of the exports, from my understanding, have a very similar composite armor package that's added on in place of the depleted uranium armor. And it is probably going to have the nearer package, the non-explosive reactive armor, somewhere in there. Once again, we don't know particularly what variant, but that's probably at least something that was on the table, if not kind of expected. As far as safety systems go, it'll probably still have the Holland firefighting system. They could opt for going a lot of domestic products on the internals here, but it's hard to say whether or not they'll go that route. Blow-up panels are going to probably stay there. Don't know that they're going to kind of go the Tusk route because urban combat's really probably not what they're looking for. Um, and the trophy is also probably an option, but not a for sure thing as that's a whole nother bag of worms we would have to get into. Um, but those are kind of the possibilities on the option. This is kind of your standard M1, A2, um, Abrams loadout in one of the SEP variants, probably the SEP 2 or 3. Um, and the export variants are at least relatively close to that. So this is a kind of good base point to look at. Most of these same options or systems will probably be on what the Romanian tanks are going to end up going to be. Its road speed is about 42 miles an hour. Once again, crew size of four, commander, gunner, driver, and loader, and an operational range of anywhere from 93 to 265 miles, depending on a lot of <laughs> variants. Its weight is just under 70 tons. If you're looking at short tons, uh, it's, it's a big boy. It's a big, heavy tank. <laughs> it is, out of the Western tanks, I think the heaviest, um, at least in modern use right now. It does have the water forwarding capability of about 2.37 meters, which is the low end of Western tanks. Romania does have quite a few waterways, but with bridges and auxiliary or support equipment, that's not necessarily as big of a deal. 
government to government purchase. This is something the U.S. government could be selling the Romanian government. This isn't something they're kind of purchasing through another place or getting the older tanks from somebody else that the U.S. just kind of approved. This is the American government to the Romanian government. And most likely, since pretty much all the variants use the same engine, it's going to be the ATG 1500 gas turbine engine. It does consume a lot of fuel because it does usually... I've seen a lot of conversation on this, and I'm really not 100% sure... In ideal conditions, from my understanding, the fuel mix that has kind of the quote-unquote jet fuel, if you will, uh, is optimal. That's kind of where you're getting the most out of the engine. But a lot of people have said other countries have at least run trials, if not semi-regularly, just use other fuels, like the regular diesel will work. Um, but you're probably not going to get to the same performance out of it that you're getting with the specified fuel mix for this engine. Uh, it is a little bit more complex, but at the same time, once you learn the system, a lot of the benefits are going to really stand out by comparison to other things. And since the Romanians are not at war like the Ukrainians, they shouldn't have any problems as far as learning this um, and being able to maintain these pretty competently. Uh, they also have quite a bit of industry industrial experience with tanks because they have kind of their own variants and they have a long kind of lineage from the Soviet era of producing um, and kind of maintaining tanks. Uh, it is a quieter engine, and it is faster to accelerate by comparison to all of its kind of diesel counterparts in Europe. So it does have benefits, but it does have some drawbacks, just like any system would. So what about the organization of Romania's tank battalions? So one battalion's roughly 54 tanks. That's exactly what they're ordering. As far as like spare por spar parts or units or repair deals, we don't really know because we don't know what the deal is yet. We don't even know the variant of the Abrams they're getting. This is a kind of the preliminary announcement this is happening. Um, nothing's probably been inked yet. It's just meetings have been had and everyone's kind of like, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. This is a good idea. Let's go this route. So we don't even know what battalion is getting this, whether it is replacing the tanks of a previous battalion or if they're just making a new one. <laughs> it's hard to say. At least three of the battalions, the 814th, 912th, and 114th, are still rocking T-55s that have been modernized. They, of course, have the 631st using the TR-85 and the 282nd using the TR-85M1, just the modernization of their modernization <laughs> of uh, the older Soviet designs they were producing. So it's hard to say. It, it could be replacing those modernized tanks, but it, I would kind of imagine that's kind of be going to be the case. Um, and the only reason I say that is all of those Soviet tanks are significantly lighter than the Abrams. The more modernized ones get closer in weight, but they're still not even close to the you know, 70 metric tons there. Uh, the T-55s are significantly lighter. Not to say that one of those battalions couldn't benefit or learn how to use the Abrams, but I'd imagine they would find another tank that's a little bit more comparable for that, whether that is older Leopard 2s or whether that's K2, K2PL. They're probably not going to rock a full fleet of Abrams like the U.S. does. And if they're... I mean... There are arguments both ways. They could absolutely replace the T-55s. They're old, even with modernization packages. And those that battalion would be pretty stoked to get Abrams, I'd imagine. But the more modernized tanks would be a little bit more comparable in terms of systems, in terms of weight, in terms of maneuverability, and kind of how you have to utilize the tank. So it might be an easier transition. We have no idea. We may not... Well, we're definitely probably not going to know until a deal is fully inked and these are in transit. Um, but at least this is the structure. These are the options. This is what those battalions are rocking and what could potentially be replaced in the future. So what about geography? Is this a prime area for the Abrams with its heavy, heaviness going around? Uh, kind of. So someone in the previous video the original video that this is following up to had mentioned um 
Romania is largely not not largely. I mean, they have a lot of artillery, and that's one of their big focuses. And a lot of armies that are kind of post-Soviet are still in that because the Soviets were largely a big artillery army. But Romania in particular kind of stuck to that largely because the Carpathians fill the entire center of the country, right? Now, of course, their capital, Bucharest, is not in this region, but this is where a large swath of their territory is. And the higher up you are, the better vantage point and the more kind of effective some artillery can be. That being said, they do have a lot of fairly flat lands, especially kind of going towards Moldova and down towards Bulgaria. So you would absolutely have the capability of using the Abrams in these areas. Mountainous areas would be a little bit more difficult where something like uh, the K2 or the Type 10 would be a little bit more beneficial with their ability to adjust their suspension. Uh, but generally speaking, you're not going to have big maneuver fights in mountain ranges. So this is probably going to be relegated to more of those flatlands down in that, those, that green region there. And while there are a lot of waterways through here, um, the Danube kind of being the largest or at least kind of the most economically important one, if you kind of will in that, in that degree, um, having additional support equipment or existing bridges that can ha handle that 70 tons kind of makes that a moot point. Um, and this is something that with Ukraine, it makes a lot more of a difference being able to ford those rivers because they're actively in a war situation where most of the time they're not just rolling support equipment out into the field to lay a bridge that, that their equipment can cross, right? Especially across the Dnieper because it is a fairly large, deep river. Here, the Romanians are not at war. They would have the ability to go through, utilize these pieces of equipment, do exercises, get used to them. So if they ever do need to use them, it's not something they're having to learn how to use in the field. And that does make a fairly large difference. But they also have a lot of intact infrastructures, so that helps too. They also have a port on the Black Sea, which is really only important to note because it, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't really affect the Abrams, um, but it does make it kind of a somewhat of a challenging power into the Black Sea. It doesn't have a large naval presence there, but it is still something that the Russians are not super stoked. Romania is not in their sphere of influence. It has the Black Sea's ports. It is close to Moldova, is close to Ukraine, and it is kind of right in spot where the Russians would like kind of a natural border to be because of the intersection of the Carpathians. So what about politics, political relations, particularly with the U.S. and Poland? So U.S. relations are pretty good. Um, Romania likes working with the U.S. They like getting U.S. equipment. They uh, are... The 99th military base houses the Aegis Offshore Ballistic Missile Defense System, which is just the Aegis system from the uh, Arleigh Burke class destroyers on land. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a scaled up variant of that. Uh, so yeah, that's a pretty cool deal. That's a big deal for missile defense in the region, um, especially kind of in relations to Russian ballistic missiles. And then you have the 57th Air Base where the Joint Task Force East is stationed. Um, so this is kind of where a lot of your air operations that happen on Romania that aren't Romanian forces are going to be coming out of the 57th Air Base. And Polish relations are also important because Poland and Romania are both part of the NATO Tailored Forward Presence and Enhanced Forward Presence Program. A lot of words to that. <laughs> really couldn't have shortened that one down, could we, guys? <laughs> but basically, they exchange troops to go to each other's countries, to help interoperability effectively. Um, that's kind of the big point of the program from my understanding. And having similar systems to the Poles is a big deal. Being able to operate alongside Polish Abrams with Romanian Abrams makes things a lot easier, especially with a kind of like grand scheme of things in terms of looking at maneuver warfare. Now the Moldova question, which is also important. Rising tensions with Ternistria is a big deal. 
Uh, Romania shares a land border with Moldova, of course, right there across the Perth River. Um, and there are concerns in Moldova that the Transnistrian region um, and kind of Russian-influenced forces are possibly plotting a coup in the country. Romania is not a military power. It is not really something that could probably defend itself super well against even the Transnistrian forces that are at least supported by the Russians, if not having kind of Russians already in the country. So it's really not a great situation for Romania to border. Um, any kind of political instability on one of your neighbor's parts is never a good thing. But not only is the border and kind of their proximity an issue, there's also a lot of ethnic cultural connections with Moldova um, just recently switching their language officially to Romanian, but a lot of um, people in Moldova also have lineage from Romanian um, ethnic groups. And much like Ukraine and its surrounding areas, much like a lot of Europe, there was a lot of kind of cross-pollination there. So they are kind of a little bit closer. There were questions at certain points of unification, uh, Modal Moldova has thought about um, referendums on this matter, but it never pulls very high, so it never really goes anywhere. But it is something that has been brought up, uh, even for a very, very uh, unpopular um, policy. It is something that's kind of remained in conversation, just because, like I said, Moldo Moldova is not a military power. They do have a couple of fairly prominent rivers that run through them, but they are landlocked. They do not have direct ports on the Black Sea or anywhere else. They don't have a super large population, and they're not uber rich. So they're a country that would be susceptible to a lot of political chaos ex that could be exploited by Russian elements, if not, like I said, the Russians directly themselves. So this has been a big concern. Ukraine has also been concerned about this because they share the other side of Moldova with the Transnistria, Transnistria region. So Moldova is a question to consider any time you're looking at Romanian uh, military concerns or geopolitical concerns. Then you have Ukraine, who shares a fairly large, long, prominent border with the Romanians. That northern border up there is where part of the Carpathians runs up, so it's the mountainous region of Ukraine. Uh, but they do share some flatlands regional borders with them as well. So if Ukraine fell, Romania would be right there on the border. And that's part of why Romania and Poland have been really big into the support of Ukraine by kind of per capita, if you will. Um, they are both fairly high up there. Um, especially in comparison to their GDP and the kind of their standing military capabilities, because uh, both forces operated large degrees of Soviet equipment. So that uh, played a big deal in it as well. But like I said, any political instability or war in one of your neighboring countries is always going to be a concern to you. Now, this is a pretty interesting move by the Romanians because this is almost possibly looking like a potential coalition within NATO, within kind of the eastern flank of NATO and Europe in general, of these kind of three groups, right? You have the Poles, you have the Romanians, and possibly the Ukrainians eventually. So even if Ukraine is not brought into NATO proper, having interoperability with Poland and Romania would be a pretty big deal because... If they're operating the same pieces of equipment, much like they were doing with the Soviet stuff, being able to at least service your damaged equipment is massive. You don't have to worry about your service centers being destroyed because they're in another country that's protected by Article 5 of NATO. But you have Polish Abrams and Polish F-16s, Romanian Abrams, Romanian F-16s. Ukraine's already been pledged around the same number of Abrams that Romania is buying. And the question of Ukrainian F-16s is probably going to continue until the war ends, um, or it eventually happens. So having... Now, of course, you know these countries are just going to operate independently, but 
having that block all using roughly the same style of equipment, um, especially the poles having experience with Leopard 2 and everything, that is a big deal. That is something that Ukraine can absolutely count on those two being more back up in the future if needed. Now, of course, that doesn't mean they're sending troops, but like I said, at the very least, they're great places for service centers um, or munitions production or something that doesn't directly put them in the conflict but supports Ukraine in the long run. So I just thought it was an interesting thing to consider that possibly after the war or you know, however things end out, as long as Ukraine still has its sovereignty, there's a good possibility that the Poles and the Romanians will do military exercises and have a lot better understanding on how these American platforms operate in that region. So what am I about my personal thoughts? Uh, so a YouTube comment from the, like I said, the previous episode, I brought this up in the beginning, I had talked about other tanks, um, which was why I wanted to kind of highlight the organization and the existing tank battalions within the Romanian military as the Abrams will take place of one, if not creating a new one. There are still several other battalions that are rocking older Soviet-era equipment, even if they've been modernized. So will they continue to do that, or are they going to look other places for maybe cheaper, more mobile tanks that could operate better in their more mountainous terrain. The Abrams is great in flat, mostly flat regions. This was originally what it was designed for us to kind of operate in those areas, but they're not super great in mountainous terrains. It's not something they've ever really tried to do, and it's not something that they're particularly well suited for. But if you look at something like the K2 or the Japanese Type 10 that have that a semi-active hydro pneumonic suspension system that allows them to operate in those terrains, they might be a viable option in the future. Now, I doubt that the Japanese will ever export the Type 10, but it's like the only other tank that has that system because Japan's very mountainous. So they see a need for that technology and the same with South Korea. Romania is kind of in a similar boat. Now, had the K2 done better in the Norway trials, maybe this would still be more open discussion. But at least at the moment, the Abrams are the only things we know of. And from my understanding, the Ministry of Defense hasn't really gone too far past that as far as looking into other platforms to replace other tanks. Not saying it's not possible, just saying not right now. Uh, of course, you know, we that could change within months. So who knows? Uh, but it is someone I wanted to thank them for that comment. Thanks for highlighting that. I think a couple of people kind of alluded to it. The one person was very just like, yeah, they'll probably look at other tanks because they have a lot of older tanks. Um, and of course, kind of going back to that whole coalition idea that there's going to be a lot of American equipment on the eastern flank of Europe. That's pretty wild. Like, like I said, the Ukrainians are going to get some Abrams of some variant later down the line. The Romanians are getting to, uh, Abrams. The Poles are getting a whole bunch of different new Abrams that they've uh, in a service center, I think. Um, so this is almost kind of like a sub coalition of uh, American uh, supported countries. Now, of course, once again, all of these countries use other pieces of equipment too. This is not like America is coming in and being like, "Hey, we're th these three countries are just military bases for us now." No. It's not like that. But having that interoperability and having these somewhat friendlier relations with the U.S., especially from a military perspective, uh, does kind of keep the U.S. somewhat centered in Europe, but also gives them the freedom to look into uh, the Pacific, which is something that has been kind of always a difficult thing for the Americans, right? Since the fall of the Soviet Union, it was more of looking, hey, let's kind of focus up on the Pacific and kind of also let NATO get new members. New members were applying. Let's go. Let's do this. Um, and having kind of, like I said, it's not mini America, obviously, but having countries in this region that are taking military procurement, military exercises, 
military coordination, military spending very seriously, at least lets the U.S. say, okay, well, we don't need to necessarily dedicate our full number of forces here. We can still fully operate and focus on the Pacific. And there's a whole lot of other things that go to that. The Pacific's largely going to be more of a marine, amphibious, naval thing, whereas Europe's going to be a lot of land and air stuff. So uh, there's differences, but a country, especially like the U.S. being torn, can absolutely do it in a time of crisis, but is not something we've really done well uh, <laughs> um, when things are a little lax because, you know, you know we kind of rest on our laurels to an extent. But anyway... Uh, some credits here, of course, wikis for like base statistics and stuff. Tank encyclopedia, as always, for uh, a lot of great information, as well as those nice tank profile shots. And of course, Defense Romania, uh, who was one of the sources that had broke the story that the Ministry of Defense was like, "Hey, we've we're work- we've got this deal that's government to government with the U.S. to get the a- these Abrams." Uh, so yeah, be sure to check these out. Of course, I didn't list all the YouTubers here. But, you know, definitely go check out all the people I've always recommended. Perun, um, uh, Ward Carroll, The Chieftain, Tankle Encyclopedia has their own YouTube channel as well, The Tank Museum. All, all those people are, you know, kind of armor in procurement more focused, and Ward Carroll's more of an aviation guy. Um, and then, you know, if you want a little bit of fun, someone like Laser Pig, Falcon's Fighter Tales, any marquee history, their you know, like their new kind of podcast thing. Um, all of those are great places to look as well. Anyway, thanks for sticking with me. Sorry this ran a little bit long, but we now know the Romanians are getting Abrams. <laughs>